I was originally gonna just make this a blog post, but fuck it, I felt inspired. Also, I just crocheted this hat uh, just now because that's what I do whenever I don't feel well is I work and I crochet things. America, man, I feel sick today. Better clock in for work. So right, the topic for this video, I'm gonna be talking about a convention that I just came back from. That's partially why my voice isn't in the most tip toppiest of shape because I kind of lost it this last weekend. So bear with me in my somewhat husky voice. You're welcome, ladies. The other thing too was that Saturday night I got sick, not from drinking, but from food poisoning a little bit. So my stomach is still, who the fuck the fuck is why you do this to me? I don't wanna, I don't want food anymore. The rest of me is like, what? You gotta have food because I need it in order to do shit. So right, put and play. For those of you who don't know, Ohio has islands. Yes, Ohio has islands. They're up on Lake Erie, up on the north part. Uh, also, might surprise you, West Virginia also has an island, Wheeling Island. It's where their casino lives, because of course. Also, keeping in theme of things to put on islands in the Midwestern states, Ohio's island, Put and Play, is largely a party island. When Chloe and I went there, we saw lots of bed and breakfast, but we also saw a lot of bars. Right across from our hotel, the Grand Islander, there was like five bars all right next to each other. There was even a bar in the Grand Islander, the level two bar, which was up on level two. And right behind the hotel was yet another bar. And there was a swim up bar at the hotel. I'm noticing a theme and it's not sobriety. The weird thing was, was that this last weekend, when I was talking with some of the people who worked and lived on the island, the general impression was the island technically wasn't open for season yet. The swim up bar at the hotel that I was at wasn't technically open. And during the rave parties, it wasn't even open for hours. We actually got yelled at by security because my buddy Chloe and I dipped our feet in the water just to soak our feet. We didn't dip anything else in the water, just the feet. And we were still told by con security to get out of the pool because they didn't get the clearance or the okay to use the swim up bar. Minor nitpick. Here's the bigger issue with this convention. I say this with love because I want conventions, especially little local ones, to succeed and I want them to grow. Now, to give you an idea of how not busy put and play was. I need to tell a little bit about how much I make at conventions. Keep in mind, I've been doing conventions for five years. I've been really heavily getting into them in the last two to three. That said, I want you to understand something. What I do is I make, I publish, and I sell original stories. I only have at most like three fan art pieces on my table at any given time. Yeah, there's pages of Johnson and Sir that make reference to things like Doctor Who, Dragon Ball Z, things like that. I have a zine for Dragon Ball Z. I have a little print of Goku and Gohan. And I have a eight and a half by 11 print featuring Johnson talking to Doctor Who. Those are the only fan art pieces on my table. Everything else is original content. With that said, you might think I'd be at a disadvantage considering that a lot of artists really want to get into the fan art scene because they think that fans have the money. They're not wrong. They're just not as right as they think they are. Cause here's the thing. At any given three day show, and I usually stick with like little regional shows. Keep this in mind too. I don't go to the big stuff like Heroes Con. The biggest show that I went to was this year. I went to Awesome Con in Washington DC for the first time. That show 
I made the most money in three days that I've ever made at a three-day con. I'm going to throw out numbers. I know it might be tacky for some artists to throw out some numbers, but I want to do this to give you some context as to what I make in my living making original content and also to give you an idea for put and play once I get back to it. At Awesome Con, by the end of the weekend, I made over $540 in three days selling original stuff. And that was my first year there. I consider that a success. There are going to be some artists that are like, well, I made double that in the same three days. I'm going to chalk it up to, they probably have been to Awesome Con for more years than I have. Again, this was my first year at Awesome Con. The other thing too is if they have more than 25% of their table as fan art, I'm not going to hold it against them. If it's something that they are into and it's something that they enjoy, cool. I am not going to shame them for making fan art of something that they legit enjoy. My buddy Chloe, pretty much 75% of the art that she makes is fan art. And it's all stuff that she enjoys. Like, she has a pretty good thumb for what's popular at anime conventions now. So that helps her. The more important thing for her though is that she gets the most bang for her buck offering commissions. That's where she makes most of her money is commissions. She doesn't actually sell that many prints of her fan art stuff. She does a lot more making money off of commissions. Cool. I don't generally do commissions at conventions. I would rather do them as Kickstarter rewards or as Patreon rewards. Anyway, back to conventions. Yeah, Awesome Con, I made over $540. At a usual three day show, I make anywhere between $350 and $450 in three days. For shows where I've made an appearance multiple years, that number goes up, mostly because people local to the area recognize me and they're like, hey, do you have anything new this year? And I'd be like, as a matter of fact, at one day shows like YWCA Minicon, last year at YWCA Minicon, I made $180 in five hours. This year I made 240 in five hours. And that was, again, because I was a repeat vendor People recognized me from last year. There were also people who recognized me from other shows in the area. So that helped too. That said, put in play as a vendor, it was a three day show. I made $61 in sales. Most of my earnings were in trading with other artists. However, there was something that I did the Monday after the show that helped make up for a little bit of this loss and I'll get to that at the end of the video. So I want to talk about what Put and Play did that kind of didn't help their cause. The first was it was on an island. Second was it was on an island and you had to pay the ferry ticket to get to the island. The ferry was seven bucks a person, $15 for a car. So for Chloe and me to get to the island, just one direction was 35 bucks. Then put and play charge tickets at the door. I didn't get a very thorough look at how much their ticket prices were, but a Sunday pass was 20 bucks. One of the things that Put and Play could have done was bundle the ticket prices so that one ticket could pay for your ferry fee and attending at the show, or have attendance at the show be free because there's already a barrier for entry having to pay for a ferry to get to the island to get to the show. The other problem that Put and Play had, and this was something that the organizers were very aware of, was that this was the weekend right after Colossal Con. Colossal Con is one of the most hyped anime conventions in Ohio, other than Ohio Con. The thing about Colossal Con, though, is that 
the organizers there are kind of hot garbage. And I'm saying this as somebody that talked with one of the organizers at Put in Play, uh, who's, I'm not going to reveal his name, but he and I were college buddies. Like he and I lived in the same dorm building. So that's how I knew him. And that's how he and I got to talk about some of the finer details of the behind the scenes stuff. He told me that the Put in Play organizers tried to get a table at Colossal Con to help promote their show. This is not an unusual practice, by the way. I've seen this happen at a lot of different shows. In fact, New Dimension Comics, the comic shop that I work for, they paid me to go to Y City Con earlier this year to help promote Three Rivers Comic Con. And Y City Comic Con was like, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Cause I'll tell you what, Zanesville, Ohio and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania are far enough apart that you can like cross promote each other and it's not really competition. The other thing too is there are anime conventions that have other conventions just set up and promote their shows. Yumacon, the convention that I usually go to is like my vacation convention. That's my vacation convention. I don't go there to sell anything. I usually end up seeing at least three other conventions have table setups there to promote their stuff. Colossal Con did not let Put and Play have a table at their convention to promote their show. Put and Play was told that they were competition and Colossal Con did not want competition setting up at their show. This is bad business practice. It is one thing to try to argue that you're in the same region. It is another thing to try to deny somebody to table at your convention because you're happening on the same weekend. Neither of those were the case though. Like, Colossal Con is in Sandusky. Say that this hand shape is Ohio. So Sandusky is about here. Put and Play is about here-ish. It's closer to Toledo than it is to Sandusky. I mean, they're technically kind of within the same region. There were people who attended Colossal Con that also went to Put and Play. And there were people obviously at Put and Play that went to Colossal Con. But the thing is, is that you can attract outside people from outside of the region to your show. Like Three Rivers Comic Con does this all the fucking time. Three Rivers had people from like New fucking Jersey and New York and Pennsylvania, as well as Ohio and West Virginia and parts of Virginia and Maryland showcasing at their show. Like, it is not unusual for a convention to attract people outside of just a 50 foot radius from their hub. It would be one thing if there was a convention happening the same weekend as another convention trying to attract people. This would be kind of like if there were representatives of Put and Play at Camp Geek Out down in Cincinnati, or if the Camp Geek Out folks had representatives up in Put and Play, because Camp Geek Out and Put and Play were happening the same exact weekend. It would be a bit tacky if there were like representatives from each of those shows at each other's shows trying to recruit other people. That would be a bit tacky and also a bit dumb because the shows are happening at the same time and are on opposite sides of the state. The other thing that Put and Play can improve on is their marketing. And I'm saying marketing to include their website, their general look of their passes, of their postcards, of their business cards, of all of their promotional material to get the word out about the show. The other thing too, is they really should have focused on other channels and not put all of their energy on Facebook. Facebook is one of the worst platforms that you can focus the majority of your energy on to try to get promotional word out there. Because Facebook's algorithm has kind of fucked people over because Facebook doesn't actually like small businesses promoting their shit unless they pay up front for ad spaces. Which, fuck you Facebook, I'm not doing it. But that's how Facebook worked get people in on the platform for the first couple of years. And then when people start wanting to promote their businesses, oh, nope, 
you have to pay five dollars if you want to reach the same audience that liked your page. Oh, we noticed that you have like 400 page likes and yet only three people like this particular post. Well, if you gave us five dollars, we can get this same post in front of this same exact number of people that like your page so that you'll get more attention on it. Eat a dick, Facebook. This is why people are going to Instagram to build their businesses because Instagram's algorithms aren't such enormous ass wipes. Anyway, yeah, Put and Play really should have focused on anything other than just putting 100% of their eggs on Facebook. In fact, I really boggled that Put and Play didn't, they didn't do this tactic that a lot of other conventions do, which is sending their promotional postcards to vendors who are slated to make appearances there. Something that I've not noticed as much with anime conventions, but something I've noticed a lot with comic conventions is that comic conventions will send their promotional flyers to local comic shops as well as vendors who are vending at their event. The thing is though, is that with most shows you have to like ask for those promotional postcards. Yeah, they're usually more than happy to send like a stack this thick of postcards for you to either take them to your local comic shop and their little freebie pile or to take to your like local music shop and drop them off in the freebie pile or to just Take them to wherever you're making your next convention appearance and being like, oh, by the way, I'm also going to be at this show on this weekend. If you're in the area, it would be cool if you got a chance to attend. Things like that. I'm really surprised that Put and Play did not do that. I don't know if anime conventions, they just don't do that. I don't go to anime conventions as a vendor much. camera went out of focus there for a second. Hold on a sec. This ultra close-up brought to you by really fuzzy close-ups because the camera does not know how to focus. So yeah, put and play was a bit of a bust. That said, I did get a lot of networking done this weekend, which was really, really good. I mean, there wasn't much else to do at the show other than talk to your table neighbors, but still I did get to talk to my table neighbors a whole bunch. They actually helped me hone down a story idea that I had been wrestling with for the last like four months, which was really nice. I also got to play D&D &D with all of the people down the same line as me, which was great. It was my buddy Chloe's first time ever playing Dungeons and Dragons. She played a tiefling bard and the night ended with Musa riding in on an owl bear, charging into the goblin camp, screaming wrecking ball. And it was great. And I also got to play a half orc druid named Ollie short for Olive. I think I'm gonna draw a picture of her pretty soon. Cause I love me half orcs in unusual roles. I love half orcs in general, they're great. The other thing that I got to do too, and I'm really glad that I got to do this. Monday on the drive down from Toledo to home, I was staying with my buddy Chloe in Toledo after put and play because good God, it is like a five hour drive unless I went to Toledo first. So stayed with my buddy Chloe and then went down and then I stopped in Bowling Green because Bowling Green is about a half hour south of Toledo. It's also where I went to school. So while I was down there, I not only got myself a cup of London Fog tea from Grounds for Thought, which by the way, that tea is delicious. If you are in the Bowling Green, Ohio area, get the to the grounds for thought and get the London Fog. It is delicious. But I also got to talk with the managers at Grounds for Thought and now my books are on consignment on their shelves. I also got to talk with Cameron's comics and stuff down the street and they got some of my comics too, which fuck yeah. So as of right now at Grounds for Thought, you can get Johnson and Sir, Charlie and Clow, The Case of the Wendigo, and Thoughtful Dinosaur at Grounds for Thought. Grounds for Thought only has two copies of each book though, so keep that in mind. At Cameron's Comics and Stuff, there's Charlie and Clow and Thoughtful Dinosaur. Those were the only ones that he got from me, but still, thank you, my dude. I also 
dropped off some surprise mini comics at Finders Records and at the Lunar Station, I believe it's called. It's right next to Cameron's. After that, then I went to Columbus and I stopped at Pack Rat Comics and talked with the people there. They said that they were interested in hosting me at some kind of a special event, like Not at Con Day or Halloween Comics Fest, which cool. And that was in Hilliard, which is a part of Columbus. And I also got Half Price Books interested in potentially having me at an author appearance or at a special event of theirs in Reynoldsburg, which is another part of Columbus. So yeah, got a lot of business done on Monday. So because of that and because of the networking that I did and finally nailing down this story idea that I had been racking with for four months, Put and Play was not a big bust for me. It was not the most stellar of shows. However, I gotta point out the good things that Put and Play did. First, their security. Oh my God, their security was great. Like, yeah, Chloe and I kind of got told by security to get our feet out of the swimming pool, but that was just more because it was their first year there. They couldn't get clearance for everything. I'm willing to let that slide. But like, if there was like a potential harassment problem, and yeah, there were potential harassment problems. As it turns out, whenever you have a convention at Put and Play and you have five bars across the street from your hotel, you're going to come across a lot of drunk people who will stalk you for high fives and possibly try to grope your ass. That happens. But yeah, con security, absolutely stellar. And they did the best that they could to make sure that all of us were safe and that none of us got stalked, which, cool. Second of all, I really appreciate that this convention tried really hard to run little after parties pretty much every day during the convention. Like Sunday, they didn't have any parties because they were like, yeah, people want to go home after the show is over. But Friday and Saturday nights, there were little parties. They didn't have a super high attendance because put and play as a whole didn't have a super high attendance. But the parties were fun. And also the music was pretty fun. I got to dance. I hadn't danced in a very long time and it was fun. The convention organizers, while they don't necessarily have a great mind for marketing and promotion, they do have a mind for how to treat their guests. They had little golf cart shuttles from the hotel to the convention center and back, which was hugely appreciated, let me tell ya. Especially because this weekend it was mostly rainy. That was another thing that didn't necessarily work and put in place favor. But yeah, the convention staff, they were super kind. They also gave us free lunch on Sunday, which was super nice of them to do that. They tried. You can tell that they wanted this show to succeed. And by all accounts, it could have succeeded. They just could have promoted their show a lot better. I'm hoping that the show can continue the good things that it has going and learn from what didn't necessarily work. I'm also hoping that they're not too discouraged by some of the negative feedback they got from some of the vendors. Alrighty, my next show is going to be Kennywood Comic Con. Yes, Kennywood, the theme park. This is a comic convention happening at an amusement park. June 17th, Father's Day. I heard that last year they did really well at this show. I did not go last year, but this will be my first year attending there. This is their second year doing the show overall. So yeah, next show, Kennywood Comic Con. Show after that is gonna be Feminist Zine Fest Pittsburgh. I'm slated to do a live reading Saturday, June 23rd, and then the show itself is June 24th, which is a Sunday from 12 to 5 at the Irma Freeman Center. Now, I also am talking with a couple of different bookstores in the Pittsburgh area about consigning my books and or making an author appearance. I'll 
do my best to keep you in the loop about that as details form. Mostly though, something like that is going to be announced on my email newsletter first. If you want to sign up for that, you can just either go to this link or check out the link in the description below. As far as vlogs go, we'll just see how this goes. Oh, before I go, uh, the Kickstarter that recently ran to help get funding for Validation's final push, holy crap, y'all blew that out of the water. Thank you so much. You rock seed our socks off. <laughs> yeah, one of our uh, reward names on the Kickstarter was Roxy My Socks Off, and oh my gosh, all of you rock seed my socks off. And also rock seed the socks off of Christian. Thank you so much. Christian is going to be working on scripts. I'm going to be finishing up a commission before I do anything else associated with this Kickstarter. In the meantime, if you can just make sure that your payment information is up to date and keep your eye on your inbox for the backer surveys, those will be sent out before the end of the week. Okay, now, now that's all. Thank you for watching. You are awesome.